All right, I'm having a little bit of hiccup with the sound, so uh, I think they can hear us on the stream, but we have no speakers in the auditorium yet, but Jared's working diligently on that up there, and so hopefully we'll get that, uh, get that going in just a minute. When we do, I'm probably going to scream in your ear. I'll try to stop as quickly as possible. Uh, good to be back. Sorry I've been gone so long. Ulysses probably thought I wasn't coming back at all. Um, I knew you were coming. He knew I was coming back. I told him when, but yeah, we. Uh, but good news, I think I'm going to be here every Sunday in December, I hope. So barring that baby coming at the time that it's not supposed to. Uh, but uh, no, she's, she's supposed to be uh, induced on the 18th, coming Wednesday the 19th, and so... Uh, or somewhere along in there, and so uh, should be here uh, all throughout December. But glad to be back. I appreciate Ulysses' good work uh, while I was gone as well. Um, and how you guys liking this material so far? Oh, wow. There's a few sour faces, Ulysses. Yeah. yeah kind of quiet. Well, what we decided was is to study the book of Leviticus. And, and, and when you study the book of Leviticus, what you learn to appreciate is that the gospel really is a whole lot easier, isn't it, than what these guys had to go through. I mean, it was what they had to go through to be compliant with the will of God. Well, certainly, the gospel's not always easy, is it? It requires a lot of us. But we don't have to have a calendar with anything really but, you know, a few days a week to keep up with where we're going. I, I was writing last night. I decided to do my lesson in red, like blood, okay? there's just so much, so many requirements going on. Um, <laughs> you don't have to have a, a herd of bulls and goats. I think we just came yeah. up. That's, that's the important thing. Yep. Yeah, we're good now. But the important thing for us, and we talked about that in the, one of our classes about Jesus Christ being that which has fulfilled everything, fulfilled the priest, I mean the uh, sacrifices and the things that Pointed to him. So therefore, we now on, on the Christ don't have a lot of that. However, principles remain the same. And uh, as we go through this, we may re make some more references to some of those. But as we begin this evening, let's give, begin with the word of prayer. Brother Jones will lead us as we begin this evening. Please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day you've given us. And Father, we thank you for having the right and the privilege to come together. Word. Father, we pray you'll be with Brother Craig and Ulysses, and they will have a ready recollection of all the wishes you poured on us, to us, and that we will listen with open hearts and learn more of the history of your people. Father, we're thankful that you sent us down our cross so we could one day have the hope of being with you in heaven. This time, Father, we pray you'll be with us throughout the service, throughout the remainder of our lives, in the place we pray. Amen. Well, last Sunday, we stopped. We were in lesson number three. We had gone through some of the questions. Some of the questions we kind of just kind of mulled over real quickly. Didn't spend a lot of time it. But we did talk about question 19. So we'll be picking up with question 20 on page 13. And this lesson is concerning the priesthood. Well, up, up till now, all of this, we've been talking about the priesthood in lesson number three. Uh, question 20 actually picks up in chapter 21 of the book of Leviticus. So before we get into that, we're talking, looking here, particularly here, these two chapters talks about the priest, deals with some regulations concerning the conduct of the priest, the priest and the holiness and the things that they were to, or how they were to conduct themselves. Are there any questions in anyone's mind concerning any of the things that we talked about in the previous lessons? Something that, that is pressing that you need to know about? A, or a question that you need to ask. Is there a question anyone has about any of that? The priesthood that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did make the point that... Uh, Many times in scripture we notice the word, num or the number seven. Seven has been identified, or many people look at it as the number of perfection or the number of completion. And concerning the seven days that uh, Aaron and his son had to stay in the tent, as I thought about that, I'm thinking that's 
culminates all of the things that God had given him for the consecration of the priest that seven days brought out the completion and the conclusion and the perfection of that. That seven days had to do with that perfection or that completion of that uh, consecration. Uh, we made a point concerning Jesus Christ, but we're going to talk some more about him because uh, he's going to be a part of this more and more as we go. But in, th in this uh, section we're picking up here, chapters 21 and 22, as I mentioned just a moment ago, has to do with the regulations. And I don't know if we have to spend a lot of time on this, but if you have questions about some of this, we'll, I guess it would be good to deal with those questions. Where have we seen this already in our discussions, the funeral regulations, as it relates to the priest? We've already studied this once. Where was that? Right. With Nadab and Abihu, right? right? We touched on this with Nadab and Abihu because remember the high priest and the, and the sons, they weren't allowed to do what? They weren't really allowed to mourn, were they? And then we learn later why. It wasn't necessarily related to the particular incident at the time. It was because of their role as priests, which we're seeing more here uh, with their role of being holy. And really, uh, as Ulysses said, questions 20 through 25 really relate to different aspects of that holiness uh, of the priest as it relates to death and to funerals. And, it, and it's about them being holy. Right. Holiness is, is the thing that God puts a lot of uh, stock in. And even when we get into the New Testament, there's a lot said about holiness. Holiness is one of those standards. I made a point a little while ago about the standard never changes. I, made, I think a point was made some time back that even though God has different uh, specifics now as we have in the gospel that, that men ought to do and abide by, God's standard of righteousness and God's standard of holiness has never changed and will never will change because God is who he is. But he has a different requirements now than he did then. But the main thing that this section talks about is the fact that God expected those who were to be priests to be, uh, well, I, I don't want to say perfect, but as, as separated, you might say, unto him as possible. They were to be different. They were to be above, uh, well, I don't like to certainly say that, use that word above, but they certainly were to be different. And uh, let's see. Let me get, get well, we back see to some of the obvious chapter. differences, don't we? In, in even the way they mourn, that the children of Israel were allowed to, to mourn the death of Nadab and Abihu and certain right. deaths, and the priests were not. There's regulations put on how they are to shave their beards, cut their hair. Those are some of the questions. And, and, and really, j these are just read and write what's in the, the answers. We're almost verbatim out of the lesson, out of the verses. But, but we see that they're different. Right. right, and that, that was in particularly for the high priest, yes, and that was particularly because he had had the anointing oil, and while they were, they were in that capacity as the high priest, they could not. But yes, there was that distinction between the high priest and the priest. But in these things, there's a couple of things that uh, in this section, they were not to uh, be defiled by anybody, by coming in contact with anybody, but also there were some regulations here about the wife that the priest was to be able to partake, which when, when I read through that and I, and I thought about it, I'm thinking, well, this type of regulation, though it's mentioned particularly for the priest, it's good, good sense and good wisdom for everybody, I would think. You know, everyone wants to marry someone who is of good, upstanding character. Is that right? Would Yeah, we hope. <laughs> but in particular, God is making a spe spe special regulation for those who are his, his people. And uh, that was a particular verse I wanted to make a point of, and my eyes are not bringing it to my eyes like right now. Well, while you're looking for that, there's three distinct, really, areas that he addresses here in these questions. One is about funerals. The second one is about marriage. And what is the third one about? It's, the, it's question 24. Do 
Yeah, their physical body. And so, you know, we think in our day and time, well, we're not, that's not politically correct. We can't talk about that. And yet, look at this restriction. God doesn't allow anyone to be a priest who would have a physical defect of any sort. And some of these would seem like somewhat minor. I mean, a, an injury, if you will. Not, not really a defect, but an injury uh, uh, it, it you see in there. So lots of stuff in there. And those are the, kind of the three major areas. Listen, you find your verse you wanted to look at? Well, there's a point made in verse 4 in chapter 21. The latter part of verse 4. Uh, he, he begins with these regulations. But then the point I want to see, look at in verse 4, the latter part, he says, being a chief man among his people, he's talking about not to profane himself. And the, the thing that uh, I've thought about, you know, when, when, the, when we went back, when we look at what happened in the case of Nadab and Abihu, what God said was, they who approach me must approach me as holy, and before the people I must be sanctified. So the people are looking at these individuals. And these individuals who are the chief among their people who are carrying out these services for God have to maintain a certain uh, image, you might say. You don't, don't want to bring disdain upon God and his services and the things God is doing. So there must be, they must be men of outstanding character. The same principle today. If a man is going to stand in a pulpit as a preacher of the gospel or the elder of a church in, in any type of leadership capacity, he cannot be one who is engaged in questionable activities. Would that make sense? Now, how many people would, would feel comfortable coming to, and worshiping in a congregation where they know the leadership of that congregation is engaged in things that don't fit good sound character? So these men, being in the position they were, had to, had to maintain this. There was an influence that was involved there, and they, had, they needed to maintain this good, proper influence. That was the, one of the thoughts that I was thinking about there. And, and sometimes that goes, I think, even beyond just the idea of maybe right, right and wrong uh, to a degree. You know, we, we, we talked about, uh, we, we talk about this in our leadership sometimes, is, is wanting to is keep staying in a position of having good spiritual influence on folks means that sometimes, you know, I might need to stay off Facebook and be speaking on certain things this, that, and the other. To get involved in some of those things may hurt and affect my influence on others about spiritual things. And while it might be well within my right to comment on certain things, is it particularly wise to do that to affect my, my influence spiritually over political or something other of that matter on Facebook where I might, who am I really going to influence and, and what difference am I really going to make in someone's life? It's far more important that I maintain my, my ability to, to, to influence someone spiritually. And so uh, I think that while that's not necessarily you know, you know, black and white and easy thing here, right, wrong, I do think that it is important. We do see that these priests, you know, Ulysses said it's hard to say, well, they're held to a higher standard, but they, but they are really, aren't they? Held to a higher standard. Right. And they pay a oh, terrible yeah. price. The most holy men here. That God has chosen, who God has chosen, that when they separate, when they are no longer clean, what is verse Leviticus 22, 1 through 3, question number 25? It says what would happen to them? They would be what? They would be cut off. They would be cut off from God, put to death, but cut off from the presence of God or from God. And so they pay a terrible price, don't they, for not being clean and pure and holy. Linda?
Yeah, Brother yeah. Buckley and I were talking about exactly that thing before. I think he had yeah. made that point. I'm not sure if that was the verse that you but, were alluding to. In fact, that's the scripture I just turned to. Okay, there you that go. That I was going to refer to, so Linda read my mind. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's a good point. That's one of the things that... Uh, in case they didn't hear, remind everyone what verse that is. Second yeah. Timothy. The scripture that was brought to mind was 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Well, the Apostle Paul, writing to this young man, Timothy, he says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, Timothy was, a, was an evangelist. His job, his responsibility was the teaching of the gospel, the spreading of the gospel, bringing people to the understanding of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These men that we are talking about, these priests, where had been, had been chosen by God and consecrated for the services of the temple that God had commissioned them to do. So they, these men also, in that same thing, were not to entangle themselves with affairs that would interfere with what God wanted them to do. You know, remember also that the Levites, these men are out of the tribe of Levi, and when they were to go into the land, and, and they hadn't entered the land yet, but it had already been stated, that they would not receive an inheritance. They would not have a land. They would not have this because they were the servants of God. They were responsible for the temple, all of those things that had to do with the, with, uh, the sacrifices. So they, even as a tribe, had been set aside by God. And the point was also made when we talked about the priests, it is God's choice. That was the important thing about all of the people having to see or needing to see. It was God's choice. And since God had chose them, God expects them also then to maintain themselves. And this point from, that Paul told Timothy falls right in line. The point that can be answered there is simply God's standard carries over. There is no change in God's standard. And see, that, that also think, thing will also come to us because I think when we get into the next lesson, some things along that line may come up. We as Christians, I make the point, we made the point uh, at the last lesson when we talked about the priesthood, how each of us as Christians or priests under Christ as our high priest, that carries with it some responsibility as well. We are as members of the body of Christ, as those who are expecting to be with God forever and ever and after a while, must maintain ourselves, must maintain our lives. We cannot live a certain life that brings dishonor to God and expect to walk before the throne of God on the last day and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's not going to happen. You're going to hear him say something like, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So this maintaining ourselves carries over to us as priests now under the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Any questions or comments really about this section before we, we move along? We do need to, need to try to move along to the next, uh, probably even get to lesson four pretty quickly. So. Where any other questions or comments or thoughts about this? Yes, sorry, I hope. So Yvonne makes the point that this is very, very detailed, and it certainly is, and that, sh that should strike us, uh, as we, even as we labor through some of these questions, just how detailed the law was. I mean, we're get to, to, to be pure and holy, these priests are having to get down into some deep details about even whether the sister, their sister is a virgin or not a virgin, or, and all of these different things, that they tremendous detail. And so she makes the point that in our time, we don't have... This much detail. We have detail, 
We have detail found in the New Testament, don't we? But we live in a culture where people just say, oh, well, none of that really matters. We've just got to obey God and, and, and very much generalize what it means to be obedient to God and throw out so many things that are found even in the New Testament. And while we don't have this level of detail, if God was so stringent on those Old Testament, on his Old Testament people, don't you think he means it when he gives us some do's and don'ts and things that we're supposed to do? You think God's just going to go, well, I said that, but really wasn't. I didn't really mean for you to take it that serious. No, these high priests, what happened? They got cut off when they didn't pay attention. And so while ours may not feel or be as stringent, we certainly better pay attention to the will of God, be obedient to every aspect. There was one point I wanted to just touch on before we go to the next lesson. Question number 26 at the bottom of the page makes reference to some things. Who was restricted from the holy things according to Leviticus 22, 10 and 13, and who was permitted? Uh, we've already t touched on some of that. But it, the main point I wanted to look at there was the fact that the stranger, the outsider, was not permitted to eat of these holy things. The point there, and even when daughter, the daughter who had been divorced, but it has come back to the house, under the father's house. The point there is that only those who were legitimately part of the priest's house had the, the right to eat of these, these holy things. And when I think about this, we, again, who are in the body of Christ, we are in the house of God. I think about this passage in, uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He said, I write unto you that you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. House of God is what I want to draw your attention to there, is that we then who are, the body of, who are in the body of Christ, who are Christians or are part of the body of Christ, which means we are the ones who have the right to the things that God has provided. Now, the spiritual things, and we won't get too deep into all of what the specifics are, but just in general, say like this. Sounds like my sound goes in and out. Anyway, what God has provided through Jesus Christ, the salvation, eternal life, all of these things are only for those who are members of the Does that make sense? There's only those who are members of the house. So we can see a parallel there, here. Only the members of the priest's house had the right to those holy things. And now us, as we are in the world. And the reason that's important, the reason I say that, you can have conversations with people or you listen to people talk and, and listen to a lot of people in the world talk. Some people have the idea that just by virtue of being in this life, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. You know, some people think like that. But the fact of the matter is, not everybody gets to go to heaven. And, not if, and heaven is not for everybody. Does that make sense? I have never been to a funeral yet where, where the preacher got up and said, boy, that dude was bad. And he's got no chance of being in heaven. There lays a pretty bad guy. I mean, you think about it, you never hear that. I think he listens is right. And I think we know people, we have friends that we, we have acquaintances, don't we, who live their life never thinking one iota about the God in heaven. But they think they're going to heaven. The inheritance, the privileges, are for those who are obedient to God. You know, this stuff seems tedious, and it is. But why did God record it for us? So we could learn how serious he is about obedience to his will if you want to be his child. And so while our law is different, our demand for obedience is no less than what these priests, or these children of Israel would have been subject to. All right? Let's move along to the Feast and the Holy Days. It, it, uh, you know, we talked a lot about this, Brother Buckley, in our, in our Exodus class, right? About Sabbaths, anyway. We mm -hmm. talked about a little bit about the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and so... Even some of this we may move through a little bit more quickly. This lesson we're going to talk a lot about another seven, something else that happens on a seven or seven times seven, and that's 
the Jubilee, right? We'll talk a little about the Jubilee and what some of those things were. Uh, again, it's just fascinating to me when we dig into these laws, uh, just how much detail there is and, and the demands that God not only puts up on his people about the sacrifices and obedience to him, but part of obedience to him, as we're going to see tonight, is don't plant any, any crops for a year uh, and, and so forth. So there's a lot of, lot of detail here. And so we, we kind of open up this section with the Sabbath of the Jubilee talking about the seventh day of the week. And of course, we know the seventh day of the week is, is a day that is supposed to be what? A day of rest. The, que- the question that Ed, or the verse that Edwin alluded to was chapter 23 and verse si- 3, which says, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord uh, in all of your dwelling places. And so certainly it is a day where no work would be done, and it is a solemn day. Uh, A day of rest, but a solemn day. Um, Thoughts or comments about that? All right. Um, Yes, I have a comment. Oh, yes. That's an interesting question. So Linda says, because we don't have uh, maybe specific commands about the Lord's Day like they did here, is that some reason, or do you think maybe that contributes to why sometimes we don't keep it as a solemn day? Did I, did I get your question correct? And yet I ask you, do we really not have guidance? Okay, maybe not in the detail of say, hey, rest, don't work, right? Don't go out and cut the yard or put up the Christmas lights or you know, whatever you're going to do on this day, just just rest. But we do have some commands about that day, don't we? What are we supposed to do on that day? We're to come together and we're to worship. But beyond that, we're to come together and we're to commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection. What has most of the world done with that, with that demand put on this day? They've decided to say, well, you know, Maybe we'll do this a different way. We'll do it quarterly, we'll do it monthly, we'll do it annually, whatever it may be. And yet the danger for us is, is that we fall prey to exactly what they're trying to avoid. And that we don't give that day its proper due, if you will. You know, you ever talk, to, I, I remember one young man in the past, he, he was struggling to get to services. And, and I, would, I would call him and I would say, hey, you know, you're going to make it tomorrow? Yeah, I'm going to try. And then the next day would come, and, and he wouldn't be here, Brother Buckley. And mm-hmm. I, I'd call him, and I'd say, hey, hey, I missed you. Yeah, I was playing video games last night till about 3. I didn't wake up. Yeah. You know, how many times do we not give Sunday its proper due? We come in here, we're worn out. Why? Because we were somewhere or doing something, playing video games or something else till one or two or three in the morning, and we didn't get the proper rest and preparation to come and to be able to focus on God's Word. They had a day of a preparation, didn't they, that they had to do on the night before to get ready. Do we not, while it may not be exactly spelled out, shouldn't we approach the Lord's Day with that same idea of preparation? I mean, some of us, we don't even come with our lessons prepared. Some of us forget to bring our Bibles. Uh, and, 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 and why? Because we're not taking the proper preparation. We would have failed Friday night to be ready for Saturday under the old law. And, and so I, I think in some ways we do have those demands on us. We just fail to give it the proper, and, and I say we, I include myself.
Yeah, you're exactly right. It used to be held in high esteem. You know, Donna and I have had this discussion a few times about what the first store in town, kind of department store that opened, and I often say it was Bella Test, and she says it was Treasure City, I think, or something. Yeah, okay, so you're agreeing with her? Well, I don't want to listen. So, no, uh, but seriously, think about that. We were having a discussion a discussion about what was the one store that, w- that first started opening on Sunday. And, uh, and now, when we have a discussion about what's closed on Sunday, look, look this Sunday after services, my son-in-law was looking for a, a, a Christmas present and he wanted something from Lifeway. Oh, well, let's go there. And we went there, and guess what? It was closed. What do you mean you're closed on Sunday? Right? Because we don't expect that anymore, do we? And it's not just that. It's ball games. Uh, all sorts of things have just rolled in. Even school events now, they're doing things on Wednesday night. Used to never be the case. Uh, and when we allow that to creep into our lives, and, and we don't give it the, the reverence and respect that we should, well, we're just failing. It's not that God hasn't given us the direction, is it? It's just we're failing to follow. Yeah, I think, uh, look, go ahead, did I have something else? Yeah, the Pharisees were good at that, weren't they? At trying to trying to change the law and 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 manipulate it, manipulate, manipulate the law, be a follower of the law without being a follower of the law. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And and are we guilty of that sometimes as well? Uh, we we certainly don't want to. Because I think about the in in the New Testament under the the Gospel of Christ, we say that there is no. It's not detailed in the same sense because it's a different system. But God has still taught, like I said a little while ago, the standard of God stays the same. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture to make a point that I want to make. The first one is Romans chapter 7, verse 6. Romans chapter 7, verse 6, he says, For now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Then in the same chapter, same book, rather, Romans over chapter uh, 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is, which is your reasonable service. The point I wanted to make here is in the New Testament, under the gospel, we do have stipulations that we well, let me back up and say it this way. God has always been concerned with the heart. The outward performances of the things that God gave under the law, he, gave, he was very specific. There were some reasons for that because they pointed to some things. They were types, you might say, of things coming down the way. Now that Christ has come, the system is different in that God doesn't look at what we perform with our hands. God looks at the condition of the heart. And if a man's heart is right with God, he will be here when it's time to worship. If his heart is right with God, he will do those things that are necessary to maintain his life the way God wants it to be. Because his heart is right with God. The point that Paul makes here is, under the law, we died to those things. It is through the spirit of the law, not in the oldness of the letter. We don't, we're not confined to the performing of, of rituals and things of that like. But God looks at what goes on inside, inside here, inside the heart. And the heart, and the scripture teaches us, as one, as one thinks in his heart, so is he. So we can, we can say that there is not so much uh, detail, so people have gotten light on this. It's because their heart's not right with God. That's what the bottom line is. And what we as individuals 
have to concentrate on is making sure my heart is where it ought to be with God, because if it is, I'll do what I need to do. Does that make sense? All right, so we talked about the Sabbath. We talked about the seventh day, and now we're going to talk about the seventh year. What happens in the seventh year? Question number two here. What are the Jews going to have to do on the seventh year? They're not going to plant their fields. They're not going to prune. Yeah, they're not going to take care of their fields. Now, this seems like a big problem, doesn't it? Because how are they going to eat? And question three is, how are they going to eat? How are they going to eat during this Sabbath year? Yeah. This is complicated. Now, <laughs> what is the point? God, God provides, doesn't he? In a year where you think, you know, look, we just recently took up the special collection for the brethren overseas because when they don't get rain, guess what? They don't eat. And that's, that's a tough thing. And so now that the rains have come, guess what? It's still going to be a while before they're able to eat. And so this could be a frightening thing. And yet God provided for them. And it said not just, hey, this is going to be one of those lean years. You need to kind of be careful and preserve to make sure you have enough food. That's not what it says, is it? God provided for them plenty what they needed to sustain them uh, over, the, over that long, long period of time. God is in control. I think I saw a hand over here real quick. Yes. Yeah. God provides, absolutely. Linda? Yeah. Yeah. So God provided on day six for manna on day seven. God provides. So we just have to trust. What happened with the children of Israel? What did a lot of them not do with the manna? They didn't trust, right? They didn't trust it was going to come tomorrow. And so they would go ahead and collect two days worth on day three. And what would happen to it? It would spoil and it would rot and God would say, no, that's not the way this is going to work. You're going to trust me. And it would have been, it would have been the same thing here that they would have had to trust it in God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All that farmer needed to do was read the scripture, right, to find out how to Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, we we just got the one minute warning, so we're going to have to wrap up here. But we're going to come in Sunday, and we're going to this one. We're going to get into the, the the jubilee, the year of jubilee, and we'll talk about the year of jubilee. And we're going to go through this. We're going to we're going to get through lesson four really quickly. Can we commit to finishing lesson four on Sunday? We will. We will do that. But the one thing I, <laughs> I didn't want, sound convinced. <laughs> yes, but when we as we go through the feast, it shouldn't take long to do it. But what I want, to, what I would like to do is as we consider these feasts, make some uh, New Testament application, you know, as to how, what they point to. There are some things about, there are four words I want to refer to, and I won't do it tonight, but there are four words that are descriptive. We'll talk about that and then talk about how that fits to the New Testament. All right. So work through those. See if you can uh, read Brother Buckley's mind and maybe even see some of that ahead of time. We'll get together and we'll get through this. And, uh, and also, we, we had already discussed lessons five and six, we are going to try to move through pretty quickly. So in your books, they are going to seem like a lot of material, but we do plan to move through those in chunks, probably not answer necessarily 
question by question. Uh, we debated taking one of those lessons out. We actually did take a lot of material out right there uh, to, to, to shrink that down. But what, in the end, we decided we're going to try to treat that as pretty quick. And I think when we get into numbers, then we're going to get back into narrative. And it's going to be, I think, a much easier study. So try to keep your patience through the rest of these last these couple lessons here with Leviticus. And let's learn the lessons God intends for us here. And then we'll get back into the narrative, which is going to be an easier study for us. Uh, the, yeah, but this is, yeah, right now we're learning a great history lesson. And, 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 and as Brother Buckley points out, every bit of this has application, okay? And we don't want to miss that, okay? Every bit of this has application. We just got to find it. Uh, and, we, and we can't go into every detail about every application or we would study this for a year, right? And so we're trying to hit as much as we can. But appreciate you hanging in there and your, and your good attention and your good comments tonight. And we'll see you on Sunday morning. Thank you.